Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. Thank you, Sarah and Clarity. You could not have picked a better song for the theme that we're trying to present this morning. I want to thank also Delmer and Ruth for giving our scripture reading and for Betty for the uh, scripture uh, for the children's story. And I want to say thank you to the veterans. I want to express my um, appreciation for y'all also. And I think, you know, we have a Pathfinder Club and we have a, an Adventure Club. We need to have a Veterans Club. Amen? Somebody needs to work on that. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Holy Spirit that you have sent to be with us this morning. Speak through me, and may the words that I speak will be your words. We want to ask also for the Holy Spirit to be with all of your believers this Sabbath day. Lead God and direct in all our lives. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. How many of you ever lost anything? Misplaced something? Keys, cell phone, wallet, anything? Well, I have. Matter of fact, uh, it was a year ago this, this last October, we had gone to CC's. And I knew I had my cell phone with me because I had used it. Got home, no cell phone. So you start your, your routine. You get somebody else's phone, you call it, nothing. You go out to the car, nothing. I called CC's, nothing. I even went back to CC's. There was nothing. So in all of this, I called and got my SIM card canceled. And sometime later, I got another phone. We have a group of people in our church that has been, that is missing, that has been neglected, that has been forgotten. But Cheryl, we have adventurers, we have pathfinders, and all the activities that go with them. We have a Sabbath school at every level from cradle roll to adult, including youth and young adult. We have women's ministries, we have prison ministries, church ministries, we have vespers, prayer meeting, VBS. We have a wonderful school and an outreach program in the Hope Clinic. We have a mission trip every year. We visit the sick and the shut-ins. What group have we neglected? It is the group of members that no longer attend our church. In the Adventist church terminology, they are listed as missing members. Last year, there were 484 members dropped for missing in the Southwestern Union. In the Texas Conference, 603. And in the Cleveland Church, zero. Wow, you say, we're doing pretty good. We haven't dropped anybody for missing last year. Wait a minute. This morning, we have an attendance of 200. And we currently have a membership of 508. Where is the other 308 difference? Now, yes, there are some of them out, the adventurers, but there's still a lot of them that is missing. My fellow believers, we have a moral obligation to search out, to find, to endeavor to reach out these, to these missing members and show them the love of Jesus. Testimonies, volume one, page 113 says, I saw that the enemy is busy to destroy souls. Exaltation has come into the ranks. There must be more humility. There is too much of an independence of spirit indulged in among the messengers. This must be laid aside, and there must be a drawing together of the servants of God. There has been too much of a spirit to ask, am I my brother's keeper? 
said the angel, Yea, thou art thy brother's keeper. Thou shouldest have a watchful care for thy brother, be interested for his welfare, and cherish a kind, loving spirit toward him. Press together, press together. Let us turn to Genesis 4, 9. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? When we stand before the judgment seat and Jesus says, Where is your brother, your sister? His and her blood is crying out to me from the ground. What will our answer be? We are our brother's keeper. We have a responsibility that Jesus has mandated. We have fulfilled the first part of Jesus' command found in Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Let's turn to that. Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20. And let's read it together. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. We have taught we have baptized, we have taught to observe all things Jesus has commanded, found in the Ten Commandments and the 28 fundamental beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. But what about his command in John 15, 12? Let's turn to that. Let's read it together. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. But Cheryl, we do love them. I want to ask you a question. How many of you have brothers and sisters? How many of you have sons and daughters? How many of you have a mother and a father or have had a mother and father? We've all had that. Would you let your mother, your father, your son or your daughter, your brother, your sister, or any relative go missing without diligently searching for them? I dare to say the answer would be no. By the way, I found the lost phone. I had opened up our chest freezer and saw something down in the bottom. Yep, you're right, it was my lost phone. I must have placed it on the edge when the door was open and it fell down and I didn't realize it. The point is, I went to great lengths to locate the misplaced phone. And we all go to great lengths when we've lost something. Should we do anything less for our non-attending brothers and sisters? There's some solemn words found in Matthew 25. Let's turn to... Matthew 25, verse 42. The first part, for I was hungry and you gave me no food. The definition for hungry, one of the definitions for hungry is to long for. Are our non-attending members hungry or longing for fellowship with fellow believers? The second half, I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. One of the definitions for thirsty is to wish for earnestly. Are they thirsting or wishing earnestly for the water of life found only through Jesus and his word? 
Verse 43, I was a stranger and you did not take me in. One of the definitions for stranger is unknown person. Are there ones we do not know that we can befriend and welcome back? Continuing, naked. Definitions for naked is exposed, unarmed. Are there members out there that are exposed and unarmed facing the temptations of this world and the wiles of the devil alone? Could we not tell them that we are here to help and that they have a savior that has faced the devil and defeated him and they can turn to Jesus and he will help them? Sick. One of the definitions for sick is tired of. Are these precious souls possibly tired of the rat race? Tired of struggling with finances or illnesses? Tired of the stress and pressures of life? Could we not visit them, encourage them, and pray with them? And the last, in prison. Are there members that feel like they are in prison, unable to escape, escape the stress of life, struggling with a sin? Shouldn't we visit and pray with them? And then verse 45 is the solemn words from Jesus. Then he will answer them saying, Assuredly I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Look at the front of your bulletin. Open up the front, go to the front of your bulletin. At the very top, re let's read it together. What does it say? Cleburne First, Seventh Day Adventist Church. That's us, right? It's all of us here. Okay, let's read what's under the picture together. A caring church. What is the definition of caring? to be concerned about or to the extent of of. Are we concerned about our inactive members? Are we living up to our motto, a caring church, showing them that Cleburne First cares for them and their salvation? The analogy, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care, rings true. Let us show them that we are caring, a caring church and that we care for them and their salvation. Now, as you know, going to church is not going to save us, correct? However, the warmth of fellowship, the praying together, the joy of meeting with fellow believers is an essential part of Christianity. You find this in the lower animal kingdom. Penguins and sheep huddle together. Wolves and caribou travel in packs. Ants, termites, and bees live in groups based on discipline, obedience, solidarity, devotion, and sharing work. From the moment they emerge from the poopy until their death, these tiny insects concentrate all their efforts into protecting the colony and feeding larvae with total disregard for their own welfare. They share their food with one another, clean their environment, and even die for one another. Herds of antelopes and zebras usually live side by side and know each other's enemies. If a zebra spots a predator stalking, it will immediately warn the antelope herd. Small birds sometimes perch on other larger birds and warn them of any danger by crying aloud. Prairie dogs are always on guard and warn all other animals in the vicinity with their cries of alarm. Antelopes and gazelles warn other animals of approaching danger by their distinctive jumping display. Do you get the picture? In the lower animal kingdom, God has instilled within them a protection mechanism. By exhibiting the love and caring of Jesus, we also can activate our protection mechanism. There is strength in numbers. One more thing about the lower animal kingdom that, that, that they can teach us. 
researchers tell us that sheep retain the memory of an absent flock member for years. Can we do any less? We must not lose the memory of these members. Let us turn to John 15. Jesus is speaking to the disciples in the upper room shortly before being betrayed. Verse 13. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. Now the popular thought on this text is that if someone died for his friend, no greater love could be displayed. I'd like to give a little bit different twist to this verse. Greater love has no man than this, that he gives his life for his friends. You say, well, that's the same thing. Yes, but think of it in this sense. We can give our time, give our talents, give our means, give our love, give our fellowship for our friends, our brothers and sisters. Go to the meditation section of your bulletin. It should be on the back. Let's read. They are his by creation and by redemption, and they are of value in his sight. They are the objects of his care and love. As the shepherd loves his sheep and cannot rest if one be missing, so in an infinitely higher degree does God love every outcast and wandering soul. Men may deny the claim of his love. They may wander far from him. They may choose for themselves another master. Yet are they God's, and he longs to recover his own. And he says, As a shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered, so will I seek out my sheep and will deliver them out of all places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. That's Ezekiel 34, 12. The Lord would have us recognize the great sacrifice of Christ for us by showing an interest in the salvation of those he came to save. That's found in Messages to Young People, page 18. Friends, Jesus came to this earth and paid the ultimate sacrifice. He endured criticism, mocking, flogging. He went through Gethsemane for you and me. He went through Gethsemane for our missing brothers and sisters. The fate of humanity was in the balance there. He could have thrown in the towel and went back to heaven, but he didn't. He endured the cross, the separation from his father because of his love for this fallen world. In return, he asked us to become his servants, to show mankind his love in word and action. In Christ's Object Lessons, page 49 and 50, we read, If we love Jesus, we shall love to live for him, to present our thank offerings to him, to labor for him. The very labor will be light. For his sake, we shall covet pain and toil and sacrifice. We shall sympathize with his longing for the salvation of men. We shall feel the same tender cravings for soul that he has felt. Friends, God is calling us to help him seek out his sheep. We must be diligent. We must act now. Can we do anything less? If the love of God is in our hearts, we will want to share it. We cannot hold it within ourselves. It's too big. It will spill out and overflow in love to others. There's three things in life that once gone, never comes back. Help me out here. What do you think they are?
I hear health. It's time, words, and opportunity. Let us take the opportunity while we can to share our time, our words of joy and encouragement with our inactive members. In Christ's Object Lessons, page 280, we read, By withholding that which God has given to us to use in his service, be it time or means or any other of his entrusted gifts, we work against him. Sometimes it only takes one contact to let a missing member know that they are missed and the person will come back to church. Most missing members, however, need time to heal, time to know the church cares, and time to grow in their relationship with God and other members. Generally, the longer a person has been away from church, the longer it will take to win them back. Many former members do not feel that they have left God. They feel they've only left the church. Sadly, some of them may never come back. But we need to reach out to them and pray for the Holy Spirit to move upon their hearts and that they will yield to his pleading. So what can we do about it? We need to each have a burden upon our hearts for this group. Agape Connections needs your prayers. This is too big for one person or even two or three. We need the entire church from cradle roll to adults helping in this ministry. The burden is now on our shoulders as to whether we want to see these brothers and sisters with us each Sabbath and involved in all the activities and ministries of this church. We are an active church. We are a growing church, but we must. It is imperative that we do all within our power through the working of the Holy Spirit to find and show our love to these members. I'd like to urge you to keep this ministry in your prayers on a daily basis. Satan is going to attack it in every way he can, but we must remember that he that is within us, he that is leading us, is greater than he that is in the world. When you received your bulletin today, you should have also received a sheet entitled Agape Connections. Is there anybody here that does not have this sheet? Raise your hand. Okay. They're bringing some now. Raise your hand high. Anybody else? There's somebody in the back. There's somebody over here on the side. Agape Connections is the beginning of this ministry that we're going to reach out to our inactive members, our missing members. If the Holy Spirit is inviting you, and I'm 100% sure that he's speaking to each one of us here, I want you to bring your sheets Fill them out, bring them up here to the front right after the service just for five minutes. This is not going to be a long meeting. We just need to know, uh, get together and decide when we will meet together and go over the details of this uh, ministry. Now we're going to need prayer water warriors. You notice that's one of them. But friends... We're going to need a lot more than that. We need mentors. There is 80 to 90 missing members 
just within driving distance of this church. So we need all of you to help. Pray about this earnestly. Friends, God is calling us to step up to the plate and bring these loved ones home. There once was a father who had two sons. They were the desire of his heart and the apple of his eye. The hours of each day were spent attending to their needs, challenging their thoughts and doing all in his power to make them strong men, good men. The three of them lived together near the sea and derived great joy from its many pleasures. The father taught his little ones to swim early, and boating became a favorite pastime. Soon the boys were as brown and stout as the bright-eyed seals who shared their playground of rock and sea. The days were full and happy under the father's loving care. One sunny day, the family decided to pack a lunch and sail up the coast for a picnic. As they journeyed northward, clouds began to erase the light of the sun, and the wind began to blow with greater fervor. But the Sea Wise family was unafraid, for they had weathered many storms. When the waves splashed higher, they worked together to guide their vessel safely, and the father was proud of his strong little men. Suddenly, and unexpectedly, a great wave crashed into the boat and whisked both of the children into the rolling sea. And although both were strong swimmers, they were no match for the rage of the storm. Despite their valiant efforts, both boys were swept farther and farther from the reeling craft. Holding on to the mast with one hand, the desperate father finally managed to throw a life rope to the youngest boy and pull him toward the boat. Scared and shivering, the boy finally climbed into the boat where he clung to his father like a vine. Briefly, his father kissed the boy's head and warmed him against his chest before securing him safely within the boat. Hold on, son. We'll be all right. We've got to help your brother. But daddy, the younger son whimpered, I'm so scared. I know you are, son. The storm is not getting any calmer, but your brother is out there. As he tried to steer the craft against the wind, the father could vaguely see the other boy's dark head bobbing between the waves. But daddy, the younger son cried, I'm cold and I'm hungry. I know you are, son, but at least you are safe in the boat. Your brother is still fighting the waves, and he must be getting very weak. But Daddy, the younger son whined, I just want to go home. With oars now in hand and both feet braced against the bottoms of the boat, the father looked straight at his littlest boy without missing a stroke. I know you are miserable, son. I can assure you that I am not enjoying this any more than you are. But how could you expect me to do anything less than using everything within my power to save your brother? You have me, Daddy, and I might fall back in. If you loved me, you'd take me home. The father smiled sadly as he flung his wet hair from his eyes and pulled harder on the oars. I know you speak from your own misery, and the warmth of home looks very good. But you must know that I am not willing that anyone should perish, but would work my hardest that anyone in danger would be able to come into the safety of this boat. And you must remember, little one, this is not just anyone. This is your brother. This is my son. 
the children, the child listened, rubbing the salt water from his eyes. And then, although he was no less frightened, no warmer, nor any less hungry, he picked up an oar and pulled toward his brother with all his might. This parable was written by a lady to use. She said, I wrote this story to use in Bible studies to explain why God has not yet come to reclaim his children. Friends, God is calling us. We need to do everything in our power to, be, to help these people that are not attending our church. The door of mercy is still open. Let us read Second Timothy, uh, Second Peter, three nine together. This is our verse that our friends read for us. But let's read it together. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. How many? All. We must not be willing that some of our missing and inactive members should perish. <clears throat>